A very good morning to all of you participants in this webinar. This is the second in the series organized by INAE. As you're all aware, the subject we have chosen is does hydrogen have a role in India's energy security strategy? We have an eminent panel and I will first take a few minutes in introducing to you something about INAE, which many of you may not be aware of. The Indian National Academy of Engineering was established in 1987. It is a society registered under the Society Registration Act. It is the only engineering academy of the country and represents India at the International Council of Academies of Engineering and Technological Sciences, CAETS, with membership from 30 countries. It is an autonomous institution, partially supported by grant in aid from the Department of Science and Technology. The entire operations of INAE are through 860 fellows of Indian origin and 84 foreign fellows. These are all distinguished engineers, engineer scientists and technologists covering all disciplines of engineering across academia, research institutions and industry. It is a forum for interaction with the Department of Science and Technology, Principal Scientific Advisor with AICTE, and it serves as a think tank for preparation of recommendations with engineering and technological inputs on subjects of strategic importance. The other area IME covers quite actively is to promote global innovation. This is in collaboration with the National Innovation Foundation. One of the unique features which has of late taken greater prominence is that INAE very actively encourages young engineers through several initiatives, through some awards, and many of them become associates of INAE. Now, the way it operates is through different methods. First of all, there are separate forums, there are expert groups. Just to give you a flavor, these cover engineering education, energy, disaster mitigation, technology foresight and management, advanced structural materials, and civil infrastructure. These are some of them. At the end of these deliberations, which our experts have, there are a number of recommendations and reports. Some of these reports have already come out and have been received very well are frugal innovation technologies for rural India, recycling of end of life automobiles, engineering interventions to achieve 175 gigawatts of re renewable energy, clean coal technologies, safe laboratory practices and waste disposal, impact of R&D on chemicals and minerals industry, technologies for healthcare, water resources, civil infrastructure. One unique uh, area which we covered was in Indian engineering heritage. And one of the major achievements was INA came out with a recommended mechanism for civil aircraft realization and production in India. There are several awards and recognitions which INA operates through. Of course, as I mentioned before, the Young Engineer Award, the Entrepreneur and Innovative Student Projects are very important ones. And most importantly, Women Engineer of the Year. In addition, of course, to veterans in the field, we recognize them through Lifetime Achievement Awards. There are several events INE organizes. These are engineers, conclaves, seminars, international conferences and conventions. Also, we operate a lot of schemes with the National Fellowships in Innovation, and of course, to encourage technologists, professors, and mentors. So this gives you a very brief backdrop of what INA is all about. I would encourage all of you to refer to the website, the reference of which is given, and that will give you many more details. 
Now let me come to the subject of today's uh, webinar. You must wonder perhaps that why is there a question mark after this whole thing, whether hydrogen has a role in India's energy strategy. It is quite awkward to know that we are dealing with an element which was one of the first elements to be born 13.7 billion years ago. Just a few hundred seconds after the Big Bang, it is said. It constitutes 74% of the known materials in the universe. But it has been an enigma. The knowledge of hydrogen and oxygen, in fact, it is said, began several thousand years ago because references in Maharshi Agastya Samhita clearly refer to Udanavayu and Pranavayu, hydrogen and oxygen. However, industrially, it was available to us roughly in 1920. In fact, the word hydrogen economy was coined by General Motors in 1970. Ever since that time, there has been a hype, a high and a low in the field of hydrogen. There have been many false starts. Today, more than 95% of hydrogen is produced from natural gas or coal and used prim primarily for refining and fertilizers. Electrolysis of water was established 200 years ago. So the question is, have technologies changed to offer cost-effective use on a large scale in new areas? It is said that the Chinese alkaline electrolysis, which is a very conventional process, costs 80% lower than the Western. There is talk of gray, blue, and green hydrogen. Now, just talking about steel, which emits 7% of the world's CO2, there is already talk about green steel. It's happening in Sweden, the hybrid process, which aim to hope to replace co coking coal by 2035. And then Germany, where the first blast furnace with hydrogen is operated already last year. The Indian de steel demand is likely to go up four times by 2050. Now comes the Indian scene. India depends 85% on imports for crude oil, 52% for gas. So when is this grand energy transition really taking place in India? Can we take an example from solar PV, where the costs have dropped 10% per year? The total costs have been down by seven by 75 percent in a 10-year period in fact theory estimates that it is likely to break the two rupees per unit barrier by 2030. it is said that india can reach 45 percent zero carbon by 2050. so this is a scenario that we have ahead of us and therefore in INA we took up this initiative of looking at hydrogen all over again, knowing fully well that this is a subject which has been covered by several experts and committees. But we thought it is timely to look at the whole situation again and see whether we can revive this whole uh, very high potential kind of area, which unfortunately has not been fully tapped. So we have chosen a very uh, knowledgeable set of panelists who have contributed tremendously in the field of hydrogen in their own domains. Let me first take this opportunity to introduce you to Dr. Ramakumar of Indian Oil, IOCL. Dr. Ramakumar is the, the Director R&D of IOCL. and has more than 30 years of research in the field of R&D, almost uninterrupted in this area. With a doctorate in chemistry from IIT Roorkee, he has piloted alternative energy research at Indian Oil in the area of hydrogen fuel cells. He has been instrumental in development of homegrown marine lubricant technology and indigenization of the Indian Oil's flagship Inmax technology. He has been publishing very uh, in a large number of journals, over 150 research publications, and he has 
already got or applied for 285 patents. He is a member of several boards of Lanzatech USA, Oil Industry Development, Central Pollution Control Society for Petroleum, Petroleum Laboratories and India Energy Forum. He presides over the International Council of IC Engines, India Chapter, the Tribology Society of India, Indian Society of Fuels and Lubricants, National Lubrication Grease Institute, India Chapter. In addition, he spearheads startup initiatives of India Oil. He has been a recipient of several awards from NPNP, FIPI, NRDC. These are all well known in the field of petroleum, AIIMA. Then the Bangalore Nano Award and the WPC Excellence Award. These are all for technologies developed by him. It is an honor for us to have him within us and I request him to take over and make his thoughts. Uh, for a very generous uh, introduction of mine and uh, a very good morning to my fellow panelists and also the audience who are joining to web for this INA webinar on hydrogen. So at Indian Oil, for long we believe that hydrogen is the uh, ultimate green mobility option and we have been working for the past decade and a half on exploiting hydrogen as an energy forum, uh, energy forum for, uh, for various applications and more so in the mobility application. So in the next 20 minutes allotted to me, I would be just uh, uh, briefly um, touching about uh, hydrogen economy landscape. Uh, I would be, because that is our forte, so I would be more concentrating on hydrogen pathways and market, and uh, I will be enlisting some of the initiatives for Indian oil in, in the domain of hydrogen and fuel cells. And then in each experiment that is being conducted by Indian oil in collaboration with Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas uh, in hydrogen CNG as a first and interim step to assuring hydrogen economy. And I will conclude uh, uh, with uh, outlining the challenges uh, for making hydrogen economy a reality. Uh, so, uh, Patwalji has uh, uh, rightly mentioned that this is, this is the first element that we discovered uh, and to be put into practice right after the brand uh, theory. And uh, I, I, I could agree more with him, and I would like to. I have few more uh, virtues of hydrogen uh, from the energy perspective if you want. The energy density of hydrogen is the highest, 33.4 kilowatt hours, as compared to the popular uh, popular mobility fuels like uh, fossil fuels like gasoline, is uh, one third of it is, uh, I guess, 12.7, and the uh, Somewhat cleaner fossil fuel compressed natural gas is 13.2. So, so, hydrogen is endowed with rich energy density to be exploited. And uh, hydrogen is, uh, is a non carbonaceous uh, uh, energy, uh, energy forum. So, it can really mitigate the carbon dioxide emission and whatever carbon. Uh, carbon uh, uh, control that we have been talking uh, to control the climate change and to preserve the ecosystem, I think hydrogen will fit very well in the equation. It improves the air quality uh, by 15 times as per the WHO guidelines. If we use it as a fuel in, in various mobility applications, uh, of course, for our country, uh, it reduces the fossil fuel imports. But there are few imperatives. If these benefits are to be realized, then we have to. There are some imperatives before we realize these uh, uh, virtues of hydrogen uh, in our day to day life. Hydrogen production pathways are associated with uh, copious amounts of carbon dioxide uh, release, carbon dioxide emissions, and uh, there is a huge carbon dioxide footprint. So, most of these hydrogen production pathways need to be calculated with uh, some suitable carbon capture and uh, utilization technology. In order that the hydrogen which is generated is really uh, remaining green. 
and uh, right now we, we while while uh, alkaline uh, based electrolysis and all are long known but still uh, the economies of scale have not been reached and uh, uh, cost of hydrogen production and cost delivered cost of hydrogen is a, is a big imperative and big challenge for all of us those who are striving to achieve in hydrogen so somebody and most of us should be working to optimize this cost angle of hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, hydrogen transportation, and final deliverance of hydrogen as a fuel. Um, uh, there are certain enabling schemes by, by the government of India. For example, the uh, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, uh, there is one uh, very, very uh, aggressive uh, uh, scheme and campaign is going on, which is known as SATAR. Satat is sustainable ultimate towards uh, affordable transport. Wherein uh, a government is seeking that all the waste, uh, organic waste that is generated in the country, and by the way, the uh, agricultural waste and organic waste put together is uh, anywhere between 62 to 63 million metric tons. And it holds the potential of uh, producing uh, uh, 15 million metric tons of uh, compressed biogas. So we convert all these agricultural and organic waste into uh, compressed biogas. And exactly that 50 million is the incremental energy demand increase per annum. So see the potential. So from this compressed biogas, see the potential of this simple reforming reaction. You can, you can still produce uh, hydrogen and uh, that hydrogen can be termed as uh, green, uh, uh, green hydrogen. So there are uh, there are several such schemes are there, enabling schemes are there, and uh, it is for the entrepreneurs and the uh, and the entities to take advantage of these uh, uh, these uh, schemes. Solar mission, solar to hydrogen to electrolysis, which is also one of the uh, areas to be pursued. I'm just uh, uh, taking a deep dive into uh, what are the production pathways today available on the arena. Uh, as Patwani uh, again mentioned in his opening remarks, steam liquid reforming is the most mature technology today. And most of the refineries, we refiners, and the largest producers of hydrogen today, uh, we, we, we associate and we employ this technology. And this has reached some kind of economies of scale. And today, this is the, this is the most mature technology for producing hydrogen from natural gas. But, uh, this is not completely green hydrogen and this is associated with carbon dioxide emissions. So, improvements are required in yield improvement and carbon dioxide footprint production as far as this technology is concerned. There are some upcoming pathways which are there. One, one of them is methanol reforming. You can reform methanol. Methanol is a great storehouse where hydrogen can be stored, converted into methanol and uh, uh, this energy can be stored. And this methanol can be reformed uh, along with water, aquaphase uh, reforming, or uh, in, a, in a dry reforming step where methanol, water, and carbon dioxide can be reformed to produce hydrogen. Coal gasification uh, is, is a long uh, practice uh, concept, long considered concept uh, of gasifying the coal and producing syn gas. And from, from syn gas, among many other products, you can also produce hydrogen. Again, uh, coal gas inflation is associated with a lot of carbon dioxide footprint, so carbon capture technologies need to be hydrogen. Water splitting for hydrogen production is a long research, uh, long research the team and uh, many schools of uh, research, including in this country, are working, still working on that. But uh, I must say that the maturity level on a PRL scale is still uh, around three to four. Whether it is uh, photo, photo electrochemical, solar thermal, uh, to hydrogen. Electrolysis is a, is a, is a pathway. Again, you can, uh, you can employ the PEM based uh, electrolysis, alkaline based electrolysis, or solid oxide electrolytic cells using uh, solar PV generated uh, electricity or wind based electricity. This is becoming quite popular in the European continent, but uh, in our country, still. Uh, uh, because any electrolysis uh, step requires 55 units of uh, electricity, whatever way you produce it, 
uh, to produce one kg of hydrogen. That is the state of the art right now, available in the electrolysis domain. So the cheaper the electricity cost comes down, the electrolysis, uh, electrolytic ways of producing hydrogen will, uh, will become more popular and more viable. I have just singled out this biomass gasification. And uh, personally, I believe that uh, biomass gasification holds the greatest potential of uh, bringing down the cost of hydrogen. Uh, uh, so this is uh, the, this slide depicts the entire value chain of the uh, hydrogen. Just mere production costs and controlling the production costs is not going to help us. Um, for hydrogen to be used to be employed as a fuel through various modes, you need to purify that, you need to compress that, you need to bottle it, and you need to actually deliver at the site. Each of these stages incurs some cost. And uh, the delivered cost is a composite figure of all these, uh, all these steps. There is, a, there is a rough estimate if you want to bring in hydrogen based fuel cell mobility into, into a reality, then the hydrogen required for fuel cells is 5 and purity hydrogen. And today it costs 21 to 22 dollars against the US DOE target of 2 to 4 percent uh, uh, gasoline, uh, gasoline gallon equivalent uh, target. By 2020, that is the US DOE is that. Um, so that is the kind of uh, uh, gap that one needs to bridge, and the research needs to be uh, focused on this particular aspect. We have done a study on uh, biomass, uh, biomass as a as a staple source for hydrogen. We have done along with the University of California this. And uh, we have taken Haryana state uh, as a model state uh, and the agricultural biomass that is available. And we could be able to establish that uh, it is extremely possible uh, through gasification route, you can produce hydrogen, which can easily meet this target of uh, 2 to 2.5 dollars per kg. And uh, a lot of, uh, I have given some figures about uh, what kind of biomass is available uh, to in our country. So this is one of the, and uh, also this biomass gas group is having an inherent advantage that you can actually deploy these hydrogen production pathway in a decentralized way. You need not be centrally produce, um, centrally uh, uh, putting up a big uh, hydrogen production unit, but uh, wherever uh, feeds are available to you there, you can, you can put up, um, you can put up a smaller unit and you can service the, uh, and user. There is an, another novel concept which we have been uh, working with an Israeli institute, Weizmann Institute uh, Israel, wherein we want to we want to tap the solar radiation and we want to innovatively store this solar radiation in a, in a very cheap uh, uh, storage medium. It's not a it's not an oil medium. It's uh, some innovative solar medium, and the heat thus stored can be can be through co electrolysis. You can convert it into hydrogen, and you can convert it into many more things. You can uh, you can generate electricity, you can generate different fuels. But one of the prominent things is that you can generate hydrogen. And uh, the, the beauty of this concept is this is still a conceptual scale. Twenty four seven availability. What what what? Uh, one of the one of the limitations of solar applications is that the limited availability of solar radiation. But uh, that limitation can be overcome if if this concept is proven. So we are setting up a uh, two megawatt uh, plant at uh, Jaipur because the only prerequisite for this concept is that the solar radiation, uh, solar radiation should be of some considerable value. That value is established by this concept. Any area which, which can give that kind of uh, solar intensity, uh, we can uh, utilize this. So by, by the next year, we are going to uh, put up this demo unit and it will be up and running. Electrolysis is, uh, uh, is, is definitely a, a much better uh, production pathway because it needs much purer hydrogen, the impurities would be much lesser. So the cost of purification of electrolytic hydrogen would be much lesser. And among the three electrolytic pathways, uh, we somehow believe that solid oxide fuel cell no, it is still in a, in a very nascent state of development, but uh, we feel that it is less energy intensive, intensive and the electricity required for hydrogen generation 
in this pathway is much lesser and uh, my r and center and my team is, is uh, working uh, working on this particular pathway besides the other two. Uh, so if I have to summarize the hydrogen production pathways as on today, so this is the uh, this is the table. Uh, I try to summarize them as per their uh, state of the art. The acidification yields is 65 to 68 percent of yields, and uh, uh, the cost, roughly the approximate cost of production, would be around 150 to 170. Biomethylation through agro residue is also slightly costlier now, but uh, it is more sustainable. And uh, the moment uh, the biomethylation technologies are perfected, probably this cost will come down. It all depends on the biotechnological intervention and uh, the, the the selection of the right kind of inoculum, uh, which can uh, which can in a fast way uh, they can yield the better yields of methane. The higher the yields of methane, the better is the hydrogen uh, yield production and uh, also the cost can be reduced. Uh, natural gas is of course the most mature technology, but if you hyphen it with a carbon capture technology to steam it and reform it, another 35 to 40 rupees per kg uh, incremental cost would be there and uh, it can it can go into the domain of 200 to 250 rupees per kg, but this is quite mature. Solar electrolysis, methanol reforming, they are all still evolving. So today the, the, the most potential things are only three. One is the steam methane reforming with an appropriate uh, carbon capture technology, or electrolysis if it can uh, it can be if the uh, electricity cost can be reduced. And third one is uh, is biomethylation or uh, conversion of agricultural uh, residue into into biomethylation and from biomethane to uh, to the hydrogen. Hydrogen storage is also a big subject. Today, last word has not yet spoken. People are uh, people are talking about uh, the physical storage in uh, in uh, cylinders, steel cylinders in a compressed form, and also composite cylinders. A lot of work is going on uh, in uh, on composite cylinders to increase the storage pressure of hydrogen. The higher the pressure, the more you can pack it, and uh, the the lesser the anxiety, the ring the anxiety when you apply it to the um, uh, transport applications. But uh, I am a chemist, so um, uh, definitely I believe that uh, chemical storage solutions are also uh, having some potential and not many chemistry, chemical classes are being explored as storage materials. Some of them are, uh, some of them are macroorganic frameworks are, 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 uh, are in the front run and, uh, 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 and many people are working. Uh, still, uh, I think there's quite a bit of distance is to travel. Uh, any of these uh, pathways to be uh, commercially viable as storage material. We are also working on uh, this. So, uh, hydrogen dispensation also, like uh, today, the regulatory compliance, uh, the regulatory permissions are only for 200 bar of compression, and minimum 250 bar is required uh, in order to get some kind of mileage and some kind of uh, range. Uh, for hydrogen-based mobility, and ultimate thing is that if we can, uh, if regulatory bodies can think of uh, 600 to 700 bar compression, if they can permit, but they can permit provided they, there are some robust materials uh, which will come into force. Uh, uh, as far as uh, hydrogen uh, infrastructure, in my R&D center is concerned, the first hydrogen dispensing station of the country it operates. Uh, it was inaugurated some 15 years back in my R&D center, right in the premises. It is still operating. We do a lot of hydrogen dispensation through uh, through the electrolyzer route. We have an electrolyzer, the PNM tube uh, electrolyzer is there, and uh, we use this hydrogen for various of our experiments uh, for servicing vehicles uh, for our own clients. And we are setting up a 90 uh, NM tube uh, uh, hydrogen generation unit too. Electrolysis route, but the beauty of this project is we would like to benchmark all the three electrolytic pathways, and uh, this is a CHT funded project, and uh, this project is fast upcoming within our premises. So we can make a comment uh, with all scientific data that which of the electrolytic pathways should we have to adopt? Should the country has to adopt uh, as one of the viable production pathways? Then which electrolytic, electrolytic pathway would be? 
what's the uh, uh, cost efficient? We will be making a comment once uh, our venture comes up and our experiments are over. Some into applications, hydrogen can be hydrogen can be directly used in ICD, but it is with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of limitations because uh, one of the major limitations is uh, and the perception and the fear in the embodiment of hydrogen, a uh, small quenching gap. So uh, though hydrogen in, in terms of mobility, the research object number of hydrogen is the highest. No other fossil liquid fuel can uh, really uh, yield that much of uh, octane number, but in spite of that, the hydrogen direct emissions of hydrogen in IC we have experimented quite a bit, and uh, not 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 a very uh, not a very natural way or a viable way. Definitely, there are two more uh, viable pathways. One is uh, you spike the complex matter gas with hydrogen, either physically or through some chemical uh, transformation group where you can directly produce hydrogen CNG blends. Right now, that is the experiment. I'll I'll give some more details on that. And definitely, the most uh, most viable option, uh, most green option, whether it is viable or not, we are, we all have to make it viable. Is the fuel cell based mobility where fuel cells are fed with hydrogen and hydrogen can be produced from a renewable, uh, renewable way. So, first of all, the hydrogen CNG experimentation. So, many countries have experimented of spiking this hydrogen with CNG, but uh, they all experimented with the hydrogen being separately produced, stored, transported, and then getting it, uh, getting injected into the CNG pipelines or CNG grid. And uh, and uh, reaping the benefits of this uh, little amount of hydrogen in the CNG in the combustion internal combustion. We thought that this would be a logistic nightmare till the hydrogen production pathways and the infrastructure is not there in the country. So we have developed a compact reforming form uh, process. Uh, it's a patented process by Indian Oil, uh, wherein the natural gas can be directly reformed in a very controlled. Control way in an innovative uh, characteristic uh, with an innovative characteristic uh, intervention, where so that the end product will be hydrogen CNG mixture, where hydrogen percentage can be controlled uh, at exactly what percentage you require. And uh, we have established to extensive field trials that 18 percent of hydrogen in CNG will give the optimal benefits uh, to the combustion efficiency, to emission reduction, and to fuel economy. Our claim was that when you spike with 18% uh, of hydrogen, 4% of food economy can be achieved in uh, heavy duty buildings, and 70% uh, of hydrocarbon emissions can be reduced, and uh, NOx also can be tackled uh, if you if you can able to optimize the recipe of your catalytic converter. So it's a, it's a great uh, a great interim and first step of bringing in hydrogen. Somehow, Honorable Supreme Court uh, took cognizance of this uh, uh, this whole technology, and uh, they have asked us to uh, run 50 buses in Delhi, which we are going to do. But for COVID, by this time, we would have completed uh, at least uh, three months of our trials in 50 buses. The beauty is that uh, hydrogen CNG doesn't require any special dispensation infrastructure. Whatever CNG infra uh, dispensation infrastructure is there. The same infrastructure can be used to dispense the hydrogen CNG also, and only a little, uh, little uh, um, um, uh, engine modification is required in terms of uh, combustion pressure and all. And um, at least the leading uh, heavy duty uh, bus manufacturers are with us in this application. In this uh, exercise, we have already set up a four ton per day uh, compact reforming process uh, plant. In uh, Rajgarh depot in Delhi. So, this takes the uh, uh, natural gas from the mother trunk line and uh, this converts it into hydrogen CNG mixture. And this hydrogen CNG will be dispensed to the buses. And we are about to start the uh, uh, trial. Uh, we are just waiting for the city transport uh, to be revived uh, uh, post COVID uh, relaxation. Apart from that, uh, we have uh, one of the... Uh, Doctor, could you just uh, watch for the time, please? Just a minute more. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm about to close. Uh, so we have uh, we have one of the uh, very good infrastructures for fuel cell research, uh, all types of fuel cell research. We have the, uh, this thing. I, I just want to 
conclude my uh, presentation with uh, this graph. This is the study which we have done uh, on life cycle emissions of all forms of uh, uh, heavy duty diesel propulsion in, in bus segment. Uh, if you see diesel and CNG, this is the life cycle CO2 emissions that they can uh, they can uh, they can view. 15, 68, uh, whatever units are there on the y-axis. Contrary to the popular belief, the electric buses, electric buses is the electricity for charging the batteries is taken from conventional grid, coal based grid. The life cycle emissions are a whopping 4,000, three times than diesel. And uh, compared to that, if hydrogen fuel cell based mobility, where hydrogen is produced from various pathways, uh, steam methane deformers, steam methane, DC stands for decentralization, biomass gasification, uh, both in a centralized form or a decentralized form. Uh, they both offer uh, very good 65% uh, of uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, footprint, uh, life cycle emissions in terms of carbon dioxide uh, lesser compared to the battery electric uh, mobility. And uh, total cost of ownership is also, uh, is also almost on par. Uh, uh, contrary to popular belief, um, uh, when economies of scale are compared, when you compare with the same uh, numbers. So, we have come up with an expression of interest right now. We are embarking upon a massive project of running 15 fuel cell buses which are propelled by hydrogen, and we are going to set up four demo units of using four uh, production pathways which are just. Uh, um, uh, presented to you, biomass gasification, solar electrolyzing, and uh, natural gas reforming would be our baseline pathway, and biomethanation through biomethanation converting biogas into hydrogen. So, these four uh, banks will generate hydrogen, and 15 buses we are going to run. This is going to be by the end of this year. Uh, many, many uh, personal equipment manufacturers uh, have shown interest uh, to partner with us on this. So, this is going to this is going to give on a scientific uh, way to the nation whether hydrogen based fuel cell mobility would be viable or not. At the end of this experiment, we would be in a position to comment and give the scientific, most authentic scientific data. We intend running 20,000 budget. I think with this, I would only like to conclude my presentation by saying that there are many imperatives. Hydrogen is no doubt uh, is having a greater role to play in our energy basket in the years to come. But uh, in order that hydrogen potential is to be exploited, we need to first address the challenges of delivered cost of hydrogen. Uh, and we have to choose and uh, optimize the correct and optimum pathway of producing it, storing it, and also fuel cell stack technology needs to be quickly indigenized. There are many efforts and many players who want to get up uh, the manufacturing units in India. So I think the future is very, very uh, bright. As far as I am concerned, for hydrogen and hydrogen based fuel. I think with this, uh, I thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity and I'll wait if any questions are there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramkumar. It was really a very good presentation because it covered the entire spectrum, all aspects of hydrogen and what is the applicability, also the cost considerations. It was very, very exhaustive. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I interrupted you a little bit for the time part because I only request people to uh, keep up with the time, but I'm sure that will be managed. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, uh, the question answers, by the way, will be all together at the end of the, all of our presentations. There will be an open Q&A session. Already the questions have started coming in, so I'm sure that uh, there will be some of them addressed to you. So let me now come to the introduction of the next speaker. Now, I have a great pleasure in introducing Dr. Ashish Lele, because he is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Engineers, working as Senior Vice President and Head, Advanced Materials and Alternate Energy Group at Reliance. Now, he is a doctorate in Chemical Engineering from the University of Delaware. He is, of course, that time, two years research associate he was with the University of Cambridge, UK where he worked on a consortium project on micro-scale polymer processing. He later spent 24 years in CSIR and is considered an authority on rheology 
of complex fluids, polymer dynamics and processing. And he was directly responsible for a lot of sponsored research at NCL. The current fields he covers are polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells, hydrogen ecosystem, carbon composites, materials for additive manufacturing, structure property relations in advanced materials. He is a recipient of the Infosys Prize of the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in Engineering Sciences, one of the most prestigious awards, and a UDCT Distinguished Alumnus Award. He has more than 73 publications in international journals, six patents, and three product technologies licensed or transferred with technologies developed by him. So it is really a pleasure, Dr. Lele, to have you with us, and I request you to share your thoughts on the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Kotwalji. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure for me to be here today, and uh, thank you for your very generous introduction. Allow me a couple of seconds to uh, share my presentation. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, just an introduction of uh, data that shows uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, various sources of emissions, activities that are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that are that are emitted. Uh, the only message I want to sh uh, say here is that, uh, as Dr. Ramkumar also mentioned, uh, we still use uh, around the world and also in India, a large amount of, of our energy comes from uh, fossil fuels uh, and various uh, sectors uh, where human activities are involved uh, are a big emitter of greenhouse gases. Uh, one of the big ones is uh, the power sector, transportation sector and the industry the main emitters of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and this will continue as long as uh, our dependence on fossil fuel uh, continues. Uh, there's a growing concern in the global community on greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, and I'll talk a few words about that in the next slide. Uh, what is emerging now is that uh, uh, hydrogen is now considered as one of the uh, big options for what is called as deep decarbonization of uh, various uh, sectors that I touched upon. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, uh, it, it is very diverse in terms of uh, what it can do because it's, it's a molecule uh, in, in principle, but it also can be very efficiently converted into electrons. So hydrogen can be looked upon as, uh, uh, as a molecule which is used for as, a, as reactants um, in industry sector we in refining uh, uh, and many other industries uh, look at hydrogen as a molecule where it is used as a reactant. Uh, but then hydrogen is also easily converted into electricity and that can be used uh, in transportation, power sector and, and so many other things. Uh, hydrogen when combusted releases a lot of heat. Its heat content is very large. Uh, so it's been used as uh, an, a heat vector as well. So basically therefore, uh, Hydrogen is a very diverse uh, energy vector that can be used as a molecule, as electrons, and as heat. Uh, and therefore, uh, one of the favorite terms today for hydrogen is that it's like a Swiss Army knife and can do a variety of uh, different things. Uh, there is a growing interest in hydrogen in the last uh, year or so. Almost every single major reputed consulting and investing uh, uh, firm uh, has brought out uh, very favorable reports for, for hydrogen because of its uh, great contribution possibilities for deep decarbonization. Uh, today, uh, hydrogen production is essentially mostly from uh, 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 oil refining, which is about 50% and, and so on. Uh, and if you look at the use of hydrogen today, it is mainly used as existing feedstocks. But if you look at the potential use of hydrogen, uh, future, uh, many of us believe that by about 2050, uh, the Swiss knife uh, uh, terminology becomes uh, actually applicable uh, and implementable. And then hydrogen will be deployed uh, as uh, any of these energy vectors in, in uh, not, on, not just as feedstock, but in transportation industry, in uh, uh, building heat and power, uh, power generations, and, and so on and so forth. So multi-dimensional use of hydrogen, uh, which will allow for 
decarbonization of many industry segments is considered to be the future for uh, for hydrogen okay uh, so dr ramkumar also touched upon uh, the challenges for hydrogen economy uh, and to me uh, the classic challenge is a chicken and egg impasse uh, and if you uh, consider the example of transportation sector uh, what this means is that if you go and talk to an oem they will say uh, you know where is the hydrogen refueling station you know what is my uh, motivation in in manufacturing fuel cell electric vehicles if i don't have refueling stations for hydrogen and if you go and talk to uh, companies like ours uh, who manufacture who produce hydrogen uh, we would say that you know why should i produce hydrogen because there are no electric vehicles on the road and so where will i consume my hydrogen so it's a very classic chicken and egg impasse and and the point is that unless uh, uh, both of these the the production and the application the utilization sectors uh, unless they grow hand in hand unless they uh, have large economies of scale that come in uh, these this impasse is is not going to be uh, solved very easily uh, a part of this problem is also that the price of hydrogen uh, remains very large compared to fossil fuels at the at, at the present time and therefore a lot of policy support is uh, required to break this impasse and and and, and a lot of uh, joint collaborative uh, consortium way of working is required even between industry to make sure that this sort of demand supply uh, problem is uh, sorted out uh, with large collaborations between companies and governments which believe in hydrogen as uh, as the next big energy vehicle uh, some of the tables here uh, show uh, the number of uh, hydrogen refueling stations today the number of fuel cell vehicles today you can see that these numbers are, are are really quite small and the price of hydrogens that is available at at the pumps today is, is quite large uh, however many uh, countries and states have been introducing uh, hydrogen mobility policies uh, it's being really picked up uh, very significantly in the clean mobility sector and uh, many leaders of hydrogen uh, in 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 the world today the governments have come up with uh, schemes of various types that that help to promote uh, hydrogen economy especially in the transportation sector uh, so therefore uh, touch upon the you know what are the drivers for hydrogen success why do we consider hydrogen to be becoming uh, increasingly important in the future uh, it is now believed that climate change is a real threat uh, that intervention uh, human uh, activities are causing a large accelerated ramp up of emissions uh, so uh, the the climate change is, is really now considered as a real threat uh, and therefore uh, uh, you know managing this energy transition is now considered as a defining issue by major oil companies and i'm sure you have read about uh, various public statements made by the uh, ceos of companies like uh, bp and shell and and many of the large oil companies uh, that talk about how energy transition must be managed by companies that are using large amounts of uh, fossil fuels or producing large amounts of fossil fuels there are also many large demo projects around the world kotwal uh, ji touched upon a couple of them hybrid for example uh, and another one so there are many large uh, demo projects in various sectors uh, that are available today that use hydrogen instead of fossil fuels and show how deep decarbonization is possible in these sectors especially these large projects are happening in uh, in in clean mobility area transportation area there are many many projects uh, that run heavy duty trucks buses uh, back to base transportation problems which are being successfully run uh, in the world and india also has started many initiatives as uh, dr ram kumar also talked about in his uh, lecture uh, there are many favorable policies i touched upon in the previous slide but importantly even large investing firms today believe that business as usual which today emit a lot of greenhouse gas emissions uh, is not going to be uh, lasting in in in, you know, in the future so it will not do any longer we must not uh, be happy with it Uh, so investors are putting in money now in a major way in clean energy projects so 
together with government and investment firms, uh, I think hydrogen is getting a really uh, significant push now. Uh, the third that is a driver for hydrogen success is, is technology improvements. Uh, in the last few decades, the fuel cell technology has uh, 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 tremendously improved. Uh, today, we have uh, fuel cells produced by companies like Toyota, which have massive uh, increase in energy density, power density per unit volume or per unit mass uh, of these fuel cells. So very significant am amount of technological improvements in fuel cells, uh, in electrocatalysis, uh, in, in gasification, biohydrogen, and also uh, hydrogen mixed with CNG that Dr. Ram Kumar touched upon. On the other hand, in, on the utilization front, uh, there are many innovations in the electric drivetrains and, and batteries, which are actually not competitors for hydrogen. They are, in fact, very complementary to, to hydrogen. So all of these innovations in producing hydrogen as well as in utilizing hydrogen uh, have uh, been a major factor in driving the success story for, for hydrogen. Finally, the fourth important driver is the economies of scale. Uh, when we see runaway growth in, in solar and wind farms, which are producing excess renewable energy, leading to curtailment, uh, instead of curtailment, uh, several large projects now take this excess uh, renewable energy and store it. And storage can be in the form of uh, various batteries like redox batteries because the, the, the size of storage required is very large. But also con people are considering hydrogen produced by electrolysis as a way to store this uh, renewable energy which is produced in excess. Similarly, economies of scale uh, come up in uh, 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 in the transportation sector, uh, as well as in uh, the electrolysis uh, technology that I will talk about in the next few slides. So uh, green hydrogen today, uh, I was asked a question about comparing the prices of green hydrogen uh, versus uh, fossil fuel based hydrogen. So the following table shows the prices of hydrogen produced by uh, steam methane reforming, which is a, a major producing technology for hydrogen by fuels. And if you look at today's uh, natural gas prices, which can range from $4 per mm BTU and to even lower, the cost of hydrogen is uh, uh, rectangle. Uh, and on the right side is the cost of electrolysis. And you will see that when the capex for electrolyzers comes down to uh, less than $400 per kilowatt, and when the cost of electricity comes to, let's say, one to two rupees per unit of electricity, so the cost of hydrogen that can be produced at utility parks would actually start looking very similar to the cost of hydrogen that is produced by uh, steam methane reforming processes. <clears throat> uh, I, I talked about the, the key drivers. The, the top left graph is uh, uh, numbers that show a curtailed electricity that is possible in, in many countries today and how that reduces the, the localized cost of hydrogen production uh, as the load factors on the electrolyzers plant go down, that's the uh, graph at the at the bottom left. Uh, there's some real life data of uh, hydrogen costs available uh, uh, today, and you can see that some of these costs, uh, comparison between SMR and uh, PEM electrolysis, uh, are actually now even today. These are real costs uh, of production in the U.S. Uh, they are actually quite comparable. Uh, and if you look at the bottom right graph, it shows how the capex for electrolyzers is dramatically reducing uh, as the economies of scale set in. So if you start producing electrolyzers which are upwards of uh, 100 megawatts, you're now touching the capex of almost $500 per kilowatt. And, and, and these are real life numbers now, they are no longer theoretical. So the costs of hydrogen produced by electrolysis is significantly coming down. I talked about uh, uh, curtailment, which is again a, a problem. The graph on the left tells you how the percentage of renew renewable electricity in uh, European countries is going up. And countries like Denmark, uh, Germany, Spain have already crossed 20% of uh, the electricity uh, produced, 20% uh, of it is met by renewables. And 20% is an interesting number because uh, that kind of penetration is considered a tipping point for grid instability. So if you want to avoid grid, grid instability, store the renewable electricity because otherwise you have to curtail it. And hydrogen is considered as one of the key uh, 
methodologies or key technologies for storing that kind of electricity through uh, electrolyzers. So this is green hydrogen produced by electrolyzer using curtailed uh, uh, energy. Uh, here is a study that we have done uh, where we'll do a very uh, interesting sensitivity analysis uh, considering four parameters of green hydrogen. Uh, there are the four quadrants that I'm showing, the electricity price on the uh, left vertical, the plant efficiency of uh, electrolyzers on the right uh, vertical, plant cost, that is the capex of electrolyzer on the top, uh, and the load factors for the plant uh, on, the, on the bottom uh, horizontal. And you can see that the, the top right corner where you have lower electricity cost, uh, the zero is, is essentially the curtailed electricity, but you can go down from zero to about three, uh, and uh, capex of about $250 per kilo, about 75, which are available today, uh, for large electrolyzers, and you are actually talking of green hydrogen prices, which are very similar to what you would get with uh, steam methane reforming. Uh, there are also many technological innovations. I will not touch upon these because of the time limitations, but in terms of uh, catalysts, in terms of engineering of electrolyzers, whether you do it in a single step or multi step processes, or you use higher efficiency electrolyzers like SOE SOEC, which Dr. Ram Kumar also mentioned. Uh, these technological innovations are bringing the cost of green hydrogen down uh, even further. Uh, there are other ways by which you can actually couple a power to gas plant uh, with a renewable electricity utility park. Uh, there's a very interesting paper in Nature Energy that has shown how you can optimize a P2X plant to produce green hydrogen when you are coupling it with uh, renewable uh, electricity, like a solar wind hybrid. Uh, paper has shown is that on the basis of uh, even today's data, uh, a, a break-even price of hydrogen is possible even today uh, in Germany and, and Texas with current productions of renewable electricity. So final slide of my take-home messages. Uh, I think today, as I said, government investors and businesses have realized that deep carbonization is absolutely essential to our and that all of them are together pushing the uh, policies and, 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 and investments in green hydrogen. Uh, this is causing a significant interest in, in hydrogen because we know that it is uh, uh, very useful in terms of its diverse energy vector applications. Uh, because of its uh, supply demand impasse, this is going to be overcome uh, because of the policy support, technology maturing, and the economies of scale. Uh, and I touched upon all of these aspects, so I will not uh, uh, revisit them. Uh, I'll just leave this slide and uh, close my talk by saying that uh, like IOCL, Reliance is a, a big believer in, in hydrogen, uh, and, and we have very strong interest in developing uh, and partnering with various uh, companies in India and abroad to develop hydrogen yeah. economy within the country. So thank you very much, and, and I'll be very happy to take uh, any questions at the end of the uh, session. I hope with your recommendations, thing really follow that path, and we don't miss the hydrogen bus. Let me now introduce you to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Sonde. Actually, I'm sure he requires not much introduction because he has been so active in this field. He's currently an executive vice president in charge of the Research, Technology and Innovation Center and member of the Executive Council at Thermax Limited. Starting with a doctorate in isotope separation simulation from IIT Bombay, he worked for 23 years in BARC and AEC, research in nuclear energy, heavy water and such fields. As Executive Director in TPC, which he later became, he founded what he used to call Energy Technologies Group, and now it's called Netra. He worked on clean coal technologies, IGCC, thermal and solar hybrid plants, while he was in NTPC. His current thrust, while he's in Thermax, among many other things, is a thrust on fuel cells, hydrogen in energy, capacitive deionization, new technologies in energy, environment and water. Incidentally, he is chairman of the Niti Aayog Task Force on Methanol from High Ash Coal 
and is a member of several committees. I'm sure you will not remember how many. He is also a recipient. In fact, I find that he has got a great affinity for gold because right from his college days, he has been receiving gold medals for his academic achievements and later research achievements, including the Baba, uh, uh, the gold medal, Baba, uh, Homi Baba gold medal, and uh, many other such achievements which are there. Most importantly, I happen to know him for a number of years. I'm sure that he breathes in air, but I'm also quite sure that he breathes out pure hydrogen. Good afternoon. Uh, it is 12 of five, so close to noon time on a near uh, close uh, solar solstice in the month of June. So sun is absolutely above my head. So hydrogen linking between renewable and fossil and uh, technological and environmental factors drive this transition. So I don't think there's any question of why hydrogen is a question how hydrogen we can make it actually as a credible energy source for this country. And my main plank, I mean, uh, I'm reinforcing what my previous two speakers have talked about, is that uh, from a current status, which has really caused all this global warming and whatever that 38 gigawatts carbon dioxide because of this 12% poor efficiency from cradle to grave. I mean, essentially the two crowning glories of the industrial revolution, the steam ranking cycle at 30 to 40% and the internal combustion engine, which is going to give you about 22 maybe 38 percent and when you couple them together for all the all the world uh, maybe from a demand side to the generation side to the transmission if you do a total audit of what is that we are actually delivering the energy to the demand side all these years with the great uh, strides that the globe has done on the back of the steam cycle and the ranking cycle and the internal combustion engine cycle is a poor 12.5 percent efficiency and probably if at all one factor which should awaken all the uh, all the all the global community is that hydrogen today allows you to give you that 60 percent cradle to grave efficiency and it can couple your renewable energy and fossil so without giving any color to hydrogen as a green hydrogen brown hydrogen this hydrogen being this one can you see the way that from today's way of uh, the energy scenario everything if i convert like a advaita philosophy into hydrogen and hydrogen becomes a harbinger of a clean energy is the way that whether it's a nuclear plant the thermal coal plant the renewable plant or refineries everything if you are able to convert that into hydrogen then hydrogen becomes a single source of energy carrier rather than the electron so the proton now takes a dominance over electron and that can then fuel all the forms of energy and that's why this transition is so compelling for, for, for not only India, to global all nations. And tomorrow, of course, on a hydrogen, you can go to a, a infinite resource of fossil, I mean, the uh, fusion energy, what is happening in the solar. So if you can able to mimic a solar uh, through, a, through a hydrogen converted into, 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 into fusion by using its, uh, its next isotope, deuterium, I think would mean that this is where we get this uh, coupling. Hydrogen, I think my, my previous colleague uh, have already talked about as the best energy storage medium is obvious. I mean, when you look at it from a megawatt scale to a gigawatt scale, from a hours to days and months and seasons, if you look at it, hydrogen storage becomes one of the best storage option. And therefore, this is something which is extremely important to be noticed that when you look at it this entire renewable energy the infirm energy and everything that you want to match the supply and demand hydrogen storage in whatever form i'm not saying hydrogen is to be stored by in its own form that is where you look at hydrogen to be converted into ammonia hydrogen to be converted into methanol i'm heading that uh, task force on methanol not for a methanol as a fuel methanol as purely a larger scale because methanol has an intensity of almost 12.5 percent weightage and 88 percent of the methanol energy is hydrogen energy and that's the only reason otherwise there is no extra affinity to a small carrying carbon and still not removing the carbon out of the equation but whether you take methanol whether you take dimethyl ether whether you take ethanol whether you take SNG whether you take LOSCs or whether you take any other forms of ammonia which is completely devoid of carbon you'll find that uh, storing hydrogen in that form gives you the best way to kind of couple it and when you see this entire i mean i'm going to be talking more on the economics aspect of it 
I have done my own homework on this. 150 rupees a kilo of hydrogen uh, delivered under micro CHP mode. The most compelling factor for us is because of the fact that today hydrogen can deliver at 75% efficiency using a micro combined heating and power. I think if you read what any farm in Japan has done and how Japan took a leadership in this particular uh, in, uh, in this particular space of hydrogen is because the hydrogen gives you that freedom of uh, having your fuel cells and these fuel cells are like the way that we are doing and my only credibility to talk on hydrogen because we are the only company which is manufacturing this high temperature proton action membrane cell which we developed along with the and along with along with csr laboratories and qiits and with the reliance where ashish was, is my partner there we developed this and today we have demonstrated that at a kilowatt scale we can deliver 50 percent power and balance 75 percent in the form of either cooling or heating and therefore that makes a, a, a very important reason why why fuel cell based uh, hydrogen system and using a, a, you don't have to go to a, a four uh, a, a purity or a two level purity it is just a, a course because the high temperature pen cell allows you that freedom of using hydrogen i'll come to that a little later i also remain i think these questions have been asked by some of the uh, some of the members in this particular group hydrogen is an excellent bridge and when i've done my modeling I still find people may not like it. People want to be fashionable to say that oh, coal, the days of the coals are numbered. But I think for India, when you do an energy security and a strategic way, coal, in my view, will continue to be main, main player for the next two to three decades. And if you see that on one hand, India will continue to depend on coal. And today, you know, last one month, the kind of policy liberalization, liberalization has happened that coal can be used not only for as a thermal power coal, but can be also used as a fuel. And that's where we have pushed it from a NITIO. And that's the top level committee where I'm a member with Minister with Secretary Coal and the Secretary of Fertilizers. That coal India, I mean coal in India will be more now converted to fuel or the or as a precursor for making ammonia, uh, petrochemicals, and many, many other important value addition, value added products because after all coal is also a hydrocarbon a very good uh, hydrocarbon at that because it's the cheapest source so when you see that there's a coal on one hand and a renewable energy on the other hand these are the two energy sources in future with hybridizing these two is the most credible pathway and that is what we are looking at it so let me do an overall energy and carbon balance and why do i say that hydrogen pathway will give me a five times more efficiency even if i'm going to a fossil route when you i take care of the carbon and because of that i think it makes an immense sense for india to actually go and develop this pathway and develop the technologies so on one hand solar and wind energy electricity is now today available at 250 paisa per kilowatt hour i mean that is something which is really one of the major major changes for us to go for a hydrogen economy because you get solar at 250 pesa, and as now Ashish also has brought that particular thing, you store it in the form of hydrogen, and you need about 55 kilowatt hours of uh, of, of uh, electricity per kg of hydrogen, which means that at 122 rupees plus, of course, the finance cost. I'll come to the finance cost, whatever is required. You will be able to deliver hydrogen. So when you take a finance cost, it may go to 200 uh, rupees, which would mean under three dollars, you will be able to generate uh, energy and store it. And on the other end, at the bottom uh, column, you can see coal or biomass innovative gasification technologies converting and synthesis gas. And we have done a huge amount of strikes. I think we have got now along with BHL and Termax, along with IT Delhi, and there's a huge program of a highest coal fluid bed technology, which will also allow you to convert coal in a most clean manner, in the most efficient manner, to get into 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 a, into hydrogen, and that also can be generated at less than uh, less than 150 rupees because there's a conversion of each kg of coal can give you about eight. I mean, eight kg of coal can give you about a kg of hydrogen. So it makes an immense sense to go up, uh, 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 go for that. And the next one is, of course, hydrogen carriers. I think there are a lot of questions on hydrogen carriers. What we are proposing here is that let us not take immediately during this uh, period carbon out of the equation. We can use the carbon coming from the residual coal plant 
thermal plants or even for the gasification plant and use that carbon to convert hydrogen to hydrogen carriers which i mentioned just a while ago and this can be done because of the new catalytic processes so much of innovation which has happened in the process chemistry of hydrogen to methanol hydrogen to methanol hydrogen to methane they are all i mean hydrogen methanol just a copper zinc oxide catalyst 80% is the conversion. So entire hydrogen can be stored in the form of a methanol and whatever CO2 comes also can be stored as a methanol, which means that the entire way, if you are able to get this pathway correct for the country, we can generate hydrogen at less than 200 rupees a kilo, which would mean at a, at a hydrogen caloric value of 33 kilowatt hours, we can deliver hydrogen at six rupees per kilowatt hour. And once you take that six rupees kilowatt hour, take it to your transport and go to the demand side with a 75% efficiency fuel cell cycle, then you understand why I'm saying that you can deliver a 60% both for the transport and other applications. So these three applications, whether it's the thermal network, whether it's a, a combined uh, stationary microgrids or CHP at a residential scale from a one kilowatt to 300 kilowatts, and hydrogen as a fuel in a fuel cell driven hybrid mobility transport all three because even in case of the fuel cell the way that we design the fuel cell operating at a high temperature the hotel load or the auxiliary load or the HVAC load can be met by the balance heat coming from the fuel cell and that my dear friends makes it absolutely beautiful concept to connect this hydrogen carrier of course you need a small reformer so that we can generate onboard reformer today there are so, so much of a, and we have developed this kind of a wash coated reformer, which are so compact, operating to ensure generate hydrogen. And since the fuel cell can take even an impure hydrogen up to 3000 ppm of carbon monoxide, you get a very, very compact system design, which delivers to 75% efficiency. And the last block here is CO2 capture and emission. Of course, we need to actually integrate it so that on the left hand side, those six blocks will give you a zero emission plan. And on the right side, because of the 75%, even a small carbon dioxide which is emitted will make this entire carbon emission very low today. And when three decades later, when we have got a complete renewable energy, maybe coal can go out of the equation and you will get completely a carbon free energy. So my submission for India to go for a hydrogen based economy or a hydrogen as energy store, we need to look at renewable energy for now solar energy for now, couple them with a CO2, use that hydrogen to convert CO2 into, into, into methanol or dimethyl ether, and use that hydrogen carrier to transport in the existing system. So key vectors in this transition phase is energy plants are now generating gigawatt scale. You have seen now Adani is going to set up a four gigawatt scale. There are a huge amount of gigawatt scale, but the unpredictable nature of the system will mean that this power will be informed. Storage from megawatt hours to gigawatt hours and from hours to month will be essential. So when you couple these two, then you know the solution lies in hydrogen. I would have talked about the flow batteries, but flow batteries are storing electrons, whereas in hydrogen system, the hydrogen storage in the form of hydrogen and the cost of that storage will be less than $30, uh, I mean, $30 a kilowatt hour. I have done some maths. I will not present that math in terms of what is the storage cost compared to lithium ion or a hydro storage or a compressor storage compared to the uh, hydrogen as a using electron, a fuel cell, flow batteries, vanadium or ferrochrome. Could be other option, but I'm not very confident because it is very corrosive. The challenges of a vanadium based storage system. And again, you need a fuel cell to convert that uh, stored uh, energy, uh, the redox energy into power again, which again means higher cost. And current liquid uh, fuel tanker system via rail and road is the best way to carry because it is difficult to invest in new renewable energy, transmounted, transmission grid, like what Elon Musk has been talking about. I think it is absolutely not possible to consider all trillion dollar investments, if you are able to use the current liquid transport by converting hydrogen into methanol or ammonia, these are the two uh, strong candidates, or maybe tomorrow in the form of a, a cyclohexane based liquid organic hydrogen carriers, you can get an energy intensity excess of 9% and that gives you a tremendous amount of advantage. Possibility to develop cluster size distributed energy plants is one which is extremely important for this country using agro residue and MSW agriculture prosperity to rural economy can be delivered by these hydrogen plants where you don't have to convert that hydrogen into methanol 
or you can directly in a square kilometer of 10, 10, uh, 10 square kilometers and meet the every energy demand of that uh, particular area. E-mobility can be revised, uh, realized using a hybrid concept and the thermal energy needs will be met. So the equations today, when I put all of them together, you will find that uh, we can get, if you are, I mean, capital costs, uh, 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 I mean, he talked about $400, my feeling is that water electrolysis, if you are able to develop this technology, we can make that under 10,000 rupees a, a, a kilowatt uh, plant, and that would give you a, 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 a hydrogen cost, which will be well within under $2 or 150 rupees. And once we talk about 150 rupees a kilo, we talk about 75% fuel cell efficiency, then everything falls in its place. So I would say that one is everything, and demand side using PV fuel cell on a 24 by 7 could be another huge entrepreneurial uh, kind of a thing which we can develop from a 1 kilowatt to 300 kilowatts. And that's another big development India can adopt for data centers, for commercial centers, for, for telecom towers and various places. This kind of a PV plus fuel cell can become an important uh, harbinger for this. Distributed hydrogen plants with a local energy network. I think we have been talking too much about agricultural economy, agricultural prosperity, and how do we really ensure that the farmer's income can be doubled or tripled? Well, of course, using the using the modern crop and modern harvesting uh, uh, technologies, but more importantly, all this agro residue using the energy plant can be converted at a 2 TPD. A 2 TPD plant we have set up in uh, in near Nagpur. Uh, of uh, biomass gasification using the absolutely lowest form which does not come in the conflict of food and food and fodder will make you develop a, a plant which can uh, source about uh, about 25 tons per day uh, of uh, of agro residue about 7000 tons per year and on a conversion it can get you two tons per day of hydrogen two tons per day of hydrogen would mean about about 12 crores of income to the farmers on a yearly basis and that two tons per day will meet all the energy requirements using the microgrids using the transport hydrogen for the transport and using hydrogen for all other energy needs so this is what it is i'm not getting to the uh, manufacturing i mean uh, hydrogen production i think today refineries are generating a lot of hydrogen we are working on developing a coal base a high pressure coal base Oxyfired fluidized bed for India's highest call with a uh, liberal funding coming as a part of my 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 chairmanship of a methanol committee. But essentially, it goes to a hydrogen route for converting that hydrogen can be kept in hydrogen form or it can be converted in our technology, which we are working with the many institutions. So I will again skip this uh, coal gasification technology and of course. What we have introduced here is again whatever is the balance CO2 coming from our uh, our uh, uh, gasification plant will be converted back into 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 methanol using hydrogen coming from electrolyzer. And if we are able to use both water and CO2 and simultaneously reduce, then you get in one step a synthesis gas. And synthesis gas is a is a magic molecule: two moles of hydrogen, one mole of carbon dioxide. You can play with that. And, and get any form of energy which is convenient to you to take care of your transport and demand side management. We have developed this uh, again for want of time. I'm not getting the details of this beautiful twin reactor system where you can get 100% of this lowest form of the uh, cotton stocks, uh, uh, raw, uh, soya stocks, uh, uh, the, the rice stocks, all these stocks which otherwise are burnt and creates a huge amount of problem can be utilized to convert that using this kind of a water-free uh, cleanup system using a using a very special uh, uh, special uh, uh, oil that we have created to make this system. And there's a 4.5 megawatt MNRE supported program which we can take. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure, uh, uh, a couple of minutes. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So there is a scheme that you can develop this, and I feel that while we are talking about the big size gigawatt size hydrogen plants, that's also possible that we can make this. The, today, the cost of this plant may be about 18 crores for a 2 TPD, and when you bring that cost from 18 crores to 10 crores, which is eminently possible, I think you will be able to get hydrogen at a much lower rate. My, as I said, uh, uh, whatever that little uh, uh, claim to glory is because we are the only company which manufactures hydrogen fuel cells. I have become kind of for me hydrogen and the fuel cell becomes my second uh, 
kind of a, I mean, my, my, my only kind of a interest now because I'm convinced that we started this for developing India's uh, air independent propulsion for the strategic sector. Now it is open in the literature that India is working on a Scorpion class, 6000 class um, a submarine using hydrogen based fuel cell. Now it's that uh, we are one of the three top countries in the world and Thermax, uh, DRDO, Navy has worked on this. And from that development, we have gone to high temperature pencil. This is a beautiful, highest state of the art technology where hydrogen uh, from the renewable or fossil or biomass, what I said earlier, can deliver efficiency on a pure power form at 50% and connect it to the cooling, it can deliver you at 75%. So this is one thing that will actually work and entire thing was developed in last three years time. And we are now in a position to actually develop this particular real cell technology with this uh, onboard reformer, as you can see all the parts here, I'll not get the details, which will be the best way to convert whatever is the hydrogen carrier into the highest form of a micro CHP. And that is, in my view, one of the turning points why hydrogen becomes important. This is a 5 kilowatt power cell generator, which were developed on a high temperature plant cell. It was dedicated to the nation uh, by the Honorable, uh, uh, Honorable uh, a minister of uh, 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 science and technology to our honorable president and this is where we are declared that a complex technology like, like a fuel cell using indigen but there is no lithium there's no cobalt it's carbon 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 all the way in fact a fuel cell today may cost about 1.5 lakhs per kilowatt uh, but it can be brought down even less than a diesel generator and can generate three times more efficiency because of the combined chp gives us an extremely important thing this is the last but one slide. Yes, end of the day, if India has to go for it, India has to look at these gasification technologies, hydrogen, natural gas, using this SOEC kind of a kind of a system. So I would like to end my uh, end my talk quoting Tagore that it is very important in this energy where the mind is without fear, head is held high, knowledge is free. Let the nation awake to the new unifying energy and assume a global leadership. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Sonde, for an exhilarating talk and uh, your passion is really contagious. Uh, now, let me introduce you to the next speaker who happens to represent and will share, I hope, with us. How is the government looking at this entire effort to about hydrogen itself? Dr. Maitani is an advisor to MNRE, Government of India. He's a doctorate in physics, MBA in public policy. Now, this is an ideal combination and it gives us comfort that policy is being made by people who have both the technical knowledge as well as the administrative. He has played a central role in policy issues related to energy and environment. He has been a key negotiator in the UNFCC for climate change and currently he leads policy and regulation for hydrogen, fuel cells and energy storage group in the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. He is also an adjunct faculty at the Terry School for Advanced Studies. Apart from all this, he has contributed to many papers and articles, but more importantly, authored two excellent books, one being on renewable energy in the global context, this was in 2008, and then again, Achieving Universal Energy Access in India, Challenges and Way Forward in 2015. So I'm sure all of us will benefit from Dr. Maitani's mature advice and his thoughts on how India and the Indian government looks at implementation of hydrogen as a philosophy. And I am really delighted to listen to this uh, distinguished panelist. This is perhaps the epitome of the, the issues, the, the prospects, and the kind of the status of the technology which has been deliberated. Dr. Ram Kumar, on a they have secondly covered the imminent issues and the technology status of the hydrogen energy. I represent government in the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. And you all who are listening today, perhaps be aware that we have been from time to time are looking forward for the a larger way how hydrogen can be mainstreamed in the Indian energy system. We had four major challenges which have been mentioned time and again. And if we go a little back in 2003, when internationally there was looking for the hydrogen economy, a big move was there and an international partnership was developed for the hydrogen. India was the first country to join that partnership. And I had a fortune to be part of that in Washington in sometime in 2003 
when this was launched. And that time we looked that hydrogen will be a competitive technology and we will have a freedom car by the year 2015 where the hydrogen will go mainstream in the country's energy systems. We in the country thereafter started looking at hydrogen in the mission mode. A hydrogen energy development board was constituted and thereafter systematically and the realizing that immediate focus has to be research and development only. The major four five areas were looked into for the research production for the low cost hydrogen. Many of the things have been mentioned by by previous speakers on that material and techniques for storage as, as has been mentioned that whether we require different kind of cylinders or it is a metal hydride or different kind of technologies and hydrogen supply chain infrastructure from one place to another place that is there and fuel cell and electrolyzers these are the most important thing that how we convert hydrogen from for electricity and then automobile applications of hydrogen these are the major areas and major projects which were taken up during this period since 2003 onwards to till date if i go and many of them have reached the international benchmarks as as we are mentioning that hydrogen internal combustion engines these were developed the iit delhi health fuel cell stacks this bhl and center for fuel cell technologies are primarily involved as a part of our research hydrogen production from the biological roots this technology has been perfected by the iit kharagpur and it has also been transferred to the industry one of the industry Hydrogen production from biomass gasification. Professor Sonday has mentioned about one of the syn gas project in a big way, but the results which have been achieved from this ISC Bangalore project says that the one kilogram of biomass can generate roughly, roughly 33 gram, 100 grams of the hydrogen, and this is really something. And the cost-wise, when we examined this, we realized that this is at par with any of the hydrogen production cost, and this again vindicates and the previous speakers have also mentioned that the hydrogen production from biomass may be one of the major area of action for the future and we should look for that in a big way. Another area for how can we store hydrogen in the metal hydrates, some of the technologies developed by the this um, Banaras Hindu University, they have they have been at par globally. We have we do have that technological benchmark under our projects and carbon materials which can be developed under um, this hydrogen and fuel cell that that is the IIT Chennai has been working in a big way application has been the coronary stone of the all of the programs which we are looking for then if we see that three wheelers or or the hydrogen buses then mahindra and mahindra and other companies in in, in line with in collaboration with iit delhi have been working in a big way and tata has also developed a bus for the hydrogen that is there so sir this is something which many of the projects in the different streams are going on many times in the ministry we go through some kind of pessimism that how far the hydrogen is there looking on the numbers and all these things last time when we started examining that the electricity is being curtailed mr lale has mentioned in the big way that curtailed renewable power can be used for hydrogen production efficiently when we started examining these prospects and what are the candidate technologies whether it is a battery based system or a hydrogen based system so the numbers which we derived with the help of experts says that if you are storing electricity more than 24 hours then and only then hydrogen becomes cost competitive and then IEA came with a new study for the future of hydrogen and then we dovetailed the projections on that and realized that yes, somewhere tipping point can come in 2025-26 and for other applications, maybe a little earlier, like for the industry application for hydrogen, that can be around the corner where it is competitive within two, three years time horizon, cost wise. So till that time, what exactly we look for? Looking all these issues, then we started looking our our, our strategizing how government has to proceed ahead in this whole hydrogen ecosystem. And a committee was constituted, uh, Professor Kasturi Rangan headed that committee, and then we came with some kind of how to go work. The recommendation was that we should go in the mission mode and four major categories, perhaps. If the technologies which are near mature or something, let's look for that what is needed for commercialization of these technologies, that is one thing. If technologies have fairly smart and, and moving ahead, then proof to the concept and set up the prototypes and some kind of the field demonstration projects for that. And all other areas should be looked for basic research and development. That was there. All these things culminated, and that time the financial requirement, which was which was put to the government of India, was around more than four thousand crores for on, on all these projects. Which you all know that in government system, that kind of money coming immediately is not that easy. Because I'm I'm telling the, the full responsibility and, uh, and that uh, and I owe it also. Then we started looking at how what should be the India's approach for the hydrogen. So then ultimately 
टू थिंग्स वी लुक दैट की एट मिशन मोड प्रोजेक्ट कैन बी लॉन्च and we started working on that and some of the projects which are under implementation are that how fuel cell technology can be indigenized and we can develop it within the country but nonetheless uh, after um, uh, since last 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 7 8 months we have been working on the national mission on the hydrogen a document that what should be the contours and if i remember uh, mr kotwal must be um, uh, privy to it that in the last uh, this this webinar of this nature i had floated the question that can we get some kind of inputs from this august gathering that what should be the component for our this mission and we at at government level feel that he let us let us go for at least six areas needs to be looked into very very specifically one is the policy support that is what we we should do that what kind of policies have to be there for facilitating technology development and acquisition and for manufacturing and for the demand creation that is the another major area which we needs to be look needs mm -hmm. another is the niche market application incidentally we started working in this area and one of the project in the lay have is that this carbon neutral lay we are trying to develop in collaboration with ntpc where we plan to have a 2 megawatt of uh, photovoltaic plant and this will support a hydrogen dispersing station in lay and they will initially run five buses and ultimately plan is that entire transport in the lay should be converted into hydrogen fuel fuel economy electricity from renewables and there after transport from the hydrogen based fuel cells and research and development as i said a number of project but the annual expenditure from the government side for the research and development where we look for the industries in the 10 to 15 crore rupees per year on an average need to be scaled up but depending upon that what kind of projects and what are the sunset clauses and what kind of the aims are before that since last one year because it has come up with the hydrogen vehicle in the country already and the first thing they came to us that can we run on the roads we said no because because the automated policy does not permit recognize hydrogen as a fuel as of now then we started working with the with the, the ministry of road transport and then bureau of indian standard and thereafter how to fill the cylinder then another organization that is petroleum and explosive safety organization we have told been told that in not more than 250 bars you can store the hydrogen international benchmarks are much higher as have been mentioned many of things so these are the areas of work which we are focusing on today primarily to look into at and then the another area comes that what kind of the collaborative nature should be there so i from the government because i need that number of groups are working my only prayer is that what kind of look that what is needed areas within next 3 years where we have to reach and that input must go in the mission we will shortly be convening the next meeting of the mission and certainly look forward for 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 inputs from from all the the kind of uh, things happening in what direction god has put that is the primary thing which i see i, I look forward from this all webinar but uh, one thing i will say because I, that we have full political wish and will to move ahead in the hydrogen economy it is a we consider it as a part of our the, the green energy revolution where renewable energy you must have seen since last 5 years has more than doubled and we expect to increase the share significantly in the electricity mix um, to go for the higher 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 percentage of electricity the 20% tipping point question uh, mr lele raised and i think i thought that i shall just just say before the giving on that that all the many of the states in india particularly if i quote andhra pradesh karnataka and tamil nadu have already broken this barrier and there are days in tamil nadu particularly in the month of july where about 70 to 80% of the total electricity is met by the renewable sources and karnataka has the same kind of situation already achieved if look at the curtailment in european setting it is 3 to 4% this is the data and in india the official data which we do have is that it is not more than 6 to 9% under any circumstances and for short term stories the 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 information and the the numbers which are before us says that the battery may be the better option for the longer term hydrogen is a better option the long transport is better option but i am sure that hydrogen carries much more promises than as is reflected today and we are working on these areas i'll stop mr kotwal here because it is 1240 only and look forward for more questions thank you very much thank you so much dr mehtan in fact uh, something of what you said was music to our ears because knowing that the government is looking at this in a very positive spirit and in fact seeking opinions from the experts as to what could be included in the policy 
I think it's an excellent kind of a direction and it gives us comfort that the real transition, the energy transition that we are now in the midst of is really going to be feasible in the clean energy direction. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitani. Now, let me uh, now open this for the most interesting part, which is the Q&A. Uh, and this is open to all participants. Um, and this, uh, you know, I have uh, I, I was actually worried about how to conduct this session. But then I got an excellent volunteer from Mr. Sachin Chuk. Let me introduce Mrs. Chuk to the audience. Now, Mrs. Sachin Chuk is a chief research manager in Indian Oil R&D Center. After his post-graduation in thermal engineering, he worked in the area of biodiesel, ethanol, hydrogen CNG, performance and emission testing of fuels, fuel additives, and lubricants. His current research areas include PEM and SOFC-based fuel cells, hydrogen infrastructure, and new drive train technologies. He has to his credit 15 research papers in international journals, and he has filed five patents in fuel cells. He's been awarded the, the Endeavour Executive Fellowship in 2014 by the Australian government to work in the area of hydrogen and fuel cells. So by himself, he's quite an expert and a very, very keen participant in the hydrogen journey. But this time, he's going to play a different role to try and collate the various questions. I'm really happy to tell you that we have received a lot of questions from the audience. And he has the difficult task of collating them and directing them to the concerned speaker. Thank you very much. And over to Sachin. Series of questions have been posted in uh, both in the chat box and in the question and answer tab. Uh, however, in the interest of time, uh, we have combined all the queries and uh, uh, to arrive at a very seamless discussion. So I'll just try to put one by one uh, to our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, my first question goes to uh, uh, Dr. Methani. Uh, sir, uh, is this current hydrogen wave uh, which you which we are viewing is here to stay or it will vanish at it, as it has been uh, happening in the past? How government of India is viewing this? Thank you. Thank you for the question that uh, let, let me be very clinical in answer that uh, Hydrogen, we consider one of the most promising technology for mainstreaming renewables in the country. And looking at the, the promise hydrogen keeps in terms of efficiency, Professor Sonde has already mentioned that we can reach to the efficiency levels very, very high than that of the other technology. And we are fully convinced of it. And all the global trends and our analysis suggest that the hydrogen is something which will continue. And we will be very happy. We will be looking forward to mainstream it as quickly as possible, at least at par with the global trends which are happening around the world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Our next question uh, is for uh, uh, Dr. Ramakumar. Uh, sir, should India embrace uh, hydrogen even though it is not 100% green at this time? Shall we start riding on the bandwagon of natural gas and then gradually shift to a renewable hydrogen? Your thoughts on in terms of GHG emissions, uh, you know, from various pathways? I, I think that's a, it's, it's a very, very uh, good comment rather than a question. And my personal feeling is, uh, Mr. Solis also brought about this. I mean, to start with, uh, we must use, uh, we must not manage the fossil fuel, but from the fossil fuel, we can uh, make it uh, uh, to produce green hydrogen, provided if we can control the carbon uh, footprint of the fossil fuel. Whether you take SMR, whether you take uh, coal gas emission, uh, uh, simultaneously a lot of aggressive research is going on to, uh, to develop a very, very cost efficient and very efficient uh, carbon capture technologies. And uh, it's only time that we should hyphenate some of these appropriate carbon capture technologies to either SMR of natural gas or uh, coal gas emission. Definitely, they will um, they will turn the grey hydrogen, otherwise grey hydrogen from these sources into green hydrogen. If not green, blue hydrogen. Uh, the intermediary blue hydrogen. I'm 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 all for it. I mean, we should not be banishing the uh, conventional fossil sources. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, next question is uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Lele, uh, sir. Although. Uh, 
although the CO2 emissions can be addressed using uh, the green hydrogen, how it stands in terms of uh, energy consumption in the entire life cycle? Can you just elaborate on that? So the current efficiencies at scale for electrolyzers is already touching 70 plus percentage. So uh, if that is the question that, uh, uh, so if you are considering purely green energy from solar and wind to hydrogen, at scale, we are today almost 70% uh, efficient, which means uh, you would need less than 50 kilowatt hours per kg of hydrogen. So 55 was a number that was quoted, uh, and that's an earlier technologies. Today's technologies at scale, uh, at commercial electrolyzers deployments, if you look at companies' profiles, uh, and if you look at the data coming out from large electrolysis installations, uh, we are already touching 50 or less units of electricity per kg of hydrogen. Uh, so the efficiencies are already much higher. There are new technology advances that are claiming even higher efficiencies. Uh, one of the paper that, and there's a startup around it uh, uh, that is claiming 93% efficiency. Uh, there are challenges there of how to operate the electrolyzer, uh, but you know there are advances happening to even go uh, to 90 percent efficiency or higher so uh, i don't know if that was the information that was sought but if efficiency is what is required we are already uh, you know at 70 percent and and looking at technologies that will go even beyond that uh, yeah uh, uh, sir means the question uh, a question particularly related to uh, vis-a-vis -vis conventional sources of energy uh, you know like natural gas to hydrogen how does the renewable energy stand and i think you have fairly put in the numbers uh, thank you very much for that i uh, uh, move to dr uh, sonde uh, sir uh, the question is that how efficient are the fuel cell recycling technologies you know developed in terms of both energy and cost and what would be the position for the India, for India, you know, in order to develop its own indigenous fuel cell technologies for the mobility sector? I mean, uh, I don't know, these are maybe two distorted questions. One is the capability of India in manufacturing fuel cell, as I said, that we are already doing it. I mean, there are a lot of things which happened for last 20 years, CFNCT and BHL, they've done enormous amount of work. But our work actually started with our uh, engagement with the strategic sector, that is the that is the submarine sector. And today we are very confident from every component from the MEA membrane electrode assembly where there is a tremendous amount of challenges to make the membranes, electrode, the graphites and the catalyst coating to the bipolar plate, the entire system is indigenized. So these are all now possible. We don't have to look to anybody in terms of making those fuel cells. Yes, the cost of today fuel cell is about $2,000 a kilowatt. I mean, you look at how Japan is providing almost 80% as a subsidy. I'm not even talking about it. We have already got a plan to bring it down to about $1,500 to less than $1,000 a kilowatt is simply possible in today because if you look at the pie chart there, platinum becomes a major thing. And you rightly mentioned, once you get a circular economy, that means if you are able to take out the uh, catalyst because the life of the fuel cell may be about, uh, about 10,000 hours, so if you are able to recycle that catalyst back into that other than the, uh, uh, the rare earths, then probably the cost of the fuel cell may be sliding down to less than less than in my view uh, 600 to 700 dollars a kilowatt or almost 30 to 40 thousand which is equal to a dg set so that is simply possible we have taken a route today to make those fuel cells based on a completely indigenous developed know-how membranes graphites bipolar plates the systems the dc dc converters the reformers the thermoelectric because we have to combine look at fuel cell with a vapor absorption system or a combined heating and power only when you put these two things together then you will find that you are able to deliver at a kilowatt scale 70 percent and there is no device in the world which can do that so my uh, permanent view is if you are able to go away from internal combustion engine you are going to go away from a steam engine fuel cell is now going to be one of the biggest uh, uh, driver for a hydrogen economy okay, okay. 
thank you very much sir and uh, your your thoughts on uh, the fuel cell recycling uh, recycling technologies uh, you know uh, in terms of their energy vis a vis batteries and how difficult and same this process is so recycling means uh, can you just tell me what is the definition i said the circular economy getting the at least back from the from this thing like the way you want to get the get the lithium as well as uh, as well as the cobalt are correct. you talking about it, yeah correct it is the component based recycling yeah because if you look at it in uh, the fuel cell major components are carbon nanofibers major component is graphite and catalyst and all three of them can be recycled but today we are not talking about a recycle because we have not reached the critical stage of critical number of uh, installations from where the recycle can start recycle will start once the government gives a go ahead for a fuel cell based technology then the recycle in a period of about 5 years will start becoming uh, becoming attractive but it will be much easier recycle than extracting a lithium or a cobalt from a cathode anode and cathode in a in a battery and i feel that it will be much easier to introduce that circular economy in a fuel cell uh, than in case of the batteries yeah uh, yeah it it perfectly addresses our question thank you very much sir uh, so my next question is uh, for uh, dr methani uh, sir uh, as as propagation of hydrogen economy would need many interministerial uh, activities to go hand in hand how is the view of the other fellow ministries of yours like mopng and morth in, pro in promoting the hydrogen culture in the country i must say it is very positive we do have a interministerial coordination uh, group now constituted under the expert committee and we meet often on this and uh, i do feel that uh, the 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 work steered by my ministry is equally supported by ministry of natural and petroleum gas petroleum and natural gas and not only that we are we are fully in sync with the department of science and technology for the lateral research which is going on in that the immediate challenge which we are addressing here is the regulatory framework for hydrogen that in what manner this hydrogen vehicles and other should come on road that is the first thing second if we are going for the limited demonstration what are the necessary approval system which are required for that purpose so we are hopeful that within very short period of time the issues are going to be sorted out there is a full process but everybody is equally on the board and understand the the importance that in what manner we have to move ahead thank you okay. thank you very much sir uh, so my next question is to dr ram kumar Uh, sir, the question which the which the audience have put is uh, related to the if effect of uh, COVID-19 on the energy demand, and how these constraints are going to affect the hydrogen-based or e-mobility-based uh, wish list which we we are propagating in India. So, your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a much talked about and uh, much debated uh, topic today uh, in, in many many uh, boardrooms uh, related to energy. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that the first two months of the, uh, the lockdown had seen a tremendous demand disruption, especially in the food sales. I come from petroleum sector, so I can uh, I can uh, very uh, authentically say. Figures, uh, the demand destruction was almost uh, 60 to 70 percent. But nevertheless, uh, uh, we we on site of the first unlock, uh, unlock, uh, unlock 1.0, as as people are calling it now, uh, has already seen demand revival for energy and for liquid fuels uh, by almost 70 percent of the people levels. The, the petrol and share petrol and uh, yeah, this is the same city we 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 are following and definitely the uh, sales are almost touching seventy percent of the peak uh, over there and uh, we don't see uh, any reason why they cannot touch the peak over levels uh, very soon but nevertheless many people feel uh, there are two schools of thought many people feel that uh, because of this people. Uh, cheaper fossil energy because of this COVID destruction, uh, the the uh, crude prices are, are they hovered at around negative prices in the first month of the COVID. Of course, now they have revived thanks to the OPEC uh, oil production cuts and all. Now they are again uh, uh, jumped back 
bounced back to forty-eight dollars. But many people thought that uh, this has shifted the goalposts for the renewable energy form because earlier, earlier uh, when crude uh, was hovering at around sixty-eight, seventy US dollars. And your uh, target cost of renewable energy was very, very uh, achievable and uh, uh, perceivable. But with the lower uh, crude oil prices, people thought that the goalposts have been suddenly shifted and uh, the, the technology players need to uh, really pull up their sources to really meet the new target. Having said that, having said that, uh, I have, I know for sure, uh, I have the authentic information that all multinational oil makers they are saying that this is the right time this is the right time to actually push up your investments in the renewable energy uh, renewable energy domain and so i think uh, the indian energy sector uh, uh, led by led by the oil marketing companies uh, oil companies uh, i'm sure uh, they they would not be they, they would not be any different and there is no revision in the in the in the domain on uh, renewable energy research, uh, renewable energy industry, definitely there is no reason in the part. And uh, as they say that in a in a in a stock market scenario, when the market is down, it is it is the right time to invest. So I I my my message is that uh, when the when the stock market is down, it is the right time to invest in the future technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Sonde, I come back to you. Uh, based on your presentation, uh, there have been many questions uh, uh, on, you know, uh, that is coal going to be the new green for India? And if yes, then what is the status and what is the hindrances, you know, to adopt this technology, which you uh, express in your slides commercially um, uh, in this country? Oh, I'll be very brief for Sachin because it's going to be very complicated. But the biggest uh, catalyst which has happened in last month on uh, on uh, on May twentieth, the government of India has passed a gazette notification thanks to PMO's in intervention. We were working with Niti Aayog. Now coal is not uh, only dedicated to the thermal uh, coal, okay? Because earlier thermal coal is coal is available to at one to be fifty pesa, whereas the coal for the industry and coal for all the other thing was available to at two times cost, three times cost. You know what happened in case of GSPL in Angol? They could not get into that particular uh, midrax process for a DRI and all that. So the biggest uh, driver government has given, and I really enormously. And honestly, compliment uh, the 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 policymakers having given the coal now is available to this kind of a kind of a uh, kind of a uh, non uh, power uh, coal. And now anybody can get into this coal mining. Anybody can uh, sell the coal to any end, end applications and at any cost. So it it means that today the coal is available to at one rupee fifty pesa or less than one thousand five hundred rupees for a highest coal like India. With a 35 percent, uh, 40 percent uh, coal and a 3,500 kilocalories, that particular coal can be actually utilized for generating all the fuel requirement. In fact, if you look at it, if you take that conversion, if India can use 100 tons, 100 million tons per annum today, India uses about 700 million tons of coal, and if you are able to use 100 million tons of coal. 25 million tons of e-coal and crude oil can be generated. This is a very straightforward equation. We are working with your SAC on a MOPNG for a uh, EIL uh, Thermax project on a coal to liquid fuels. So, but then, of course, there's a lot of uh, carbon involved in that. So coal to liquid fuel, coal to methanol, coal to hydrogen now is eminently possible. Now, the issue that you're asking is very important. What happens to the carbon dioxide? That's an important issue which we need to do it. And as I said in my, my presentation, if you are able to couple that carbon dioxide with the water, both are H2O and CO2, and use the renewable electricity which is available to at one at two rupee twenty pesa. So take these two equations: electricity is available to at two rupee twenty pesa, coal is available to at one rupee fifty pesa. And when you couple them and marry them, you get a synthesis gas and hydrogen which is actually going to give you a zero emission plan and an ample source of hydrogen carrying fuel. Yes, carbon is still there, but carbon is now intensity of the carbon from 100% carbon comes down to about less than 20% carbon intensity. And that is what makes this whole thing absolutely a, a, a virtual cycle for this country. India can depend on the now renewable energy. Storage options are taken up. 
our security is addressed because of the coal and then of course the entire cycle efficiency will be so much that climate change will happen and all these technologies can be indigenized so that the growth cycle unlike in the pv can happen within the country and the prosperity of this nation will happen if you are able to adopt to this particular strategy is my firm conviction sachin on this thank you uh, mr sachin can i now take over because unfortunately our uh, time is constrained uh, yes, sir, sure. people say that all good things come to an end but i think here all the great things are new beginnings are coming to an end so this is something which is really um, quite a value adding session for me personally and i hope for the others who are participating i must profusely thank all the four speakers for giving an excellent input from their own perspectives which are so vital in modulating and really forming the policy as we go forward i must only mention that india is really today on a major energy transition choices are available today and with the technology which has so quickly developed over the last few years it gives confidence that there is a government which also blesses this kind of direction that is a combination which i think uh, really augurs well for the country and i wish all of the people who are involved all the best in taking india to this new journey towards a hydrogen based economy thank you very much all of you and all the participants for your active participation i must request the speakers to be uh, kind enough to reply to some of the questions which may be directed to them uh, by sachin of on your respective emails and if you kindly spare some time to sort out those questions it will be a great addition to the entire inquisitiveness of the audience thank you very much